And it looks like we are live. Excellent. Hello, all my little Tuesday friends. Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon or good evening tomorrow if you're in Australia yep. or wherever. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, by the way, in Australia, Brian Cab, happy yes. birthday. Indeed. So we wore blue today in honor of today's very special guest uh, that you can see scrolling across the bottom. And I hope uh, after the broadcast, you will go and uh, check out his wonderful website at grantgeisman.com. That's with two S's and, two S's and one N. Um, he is a legendary blues guitarist. And we'll also talk about his keyboard playing today. He has just been nominated for a Grammy for his latest album, Blues, which I will show you here, which is probably backwards, but you get the picture. But that's why we're wearing blue, and our thing is blue. And without further ado, and the crowd goes wild, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Grant Geisman. Hi, Grant. Hi. Hi. I should have worn blue, too. I don't know what I was thinking. I know. <laughs> well, you you didn't check on the wardrobe, did you? No. Never mind. Yeah, we didn't have time for a wardrobe meeting this morning. No. So that's good. Uh, well, thanks. And thanks. I do notice the streaming thing on the bottom says Grammy winning guitar legend. Let's not jump the gun. I'm only oh. Grammy nominated at this moment. Okay. Well, but, you're uh, Emmy, Emmy winning. Okay. Nope, you know Emmy nominated. Yeah. I've been nominated, nominated, you know, a couple of Emmys, um, never won, and I've never been nominated for a Grammy. I mean, previously to now. So this is my first nomination. And maybe that little stream is, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, predicting the future in some way. Yes, but, you uh, see, I had, my, I had my crystal ball out when we wrote that, but I have updated it because, yes, we do want to be you correct. You are fast. Yeah, so, so they say, the digital diva. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just so hard to wrap one's head around the enormity of the career that you've you've had and continue to have because it's I get all confused between, you know, Emmys and Grammys and Oscars and all of those things, which is why we have FYC pages, right, for your considerations. Um, but tell us all about how did this current Grammy-nominated blues album come to life and, and it re reunites you with an old label, correct? Correct. Well, you know, it's actually my 16th album that I've done oh. over, you know, a fairly long career. And like I mentioned, I've done all these records, but I've never been nominated before. But... Um, the idea for the blues album has kind of been in the back of my mind for a while. And it kind of came more to a head basically by hanging out at Norman's Rare Guitars and meeting a bunch of great players and, you know, kind of hearing them play and their approach to music. I mean, I met, you know, Joe Bonamassa and Josh Smith and John Jorgensen. I met all those guys through Norm just by kind of hanging out. So, you know, then the album kind of started to take more shape in my mind. So, um, and then we were coming out of pandemic. So we started recording it in January when things had kind of opened up. And uh, it was like, it's now possible to get a whole band in the studio and, and record. So, and it kind of felt like we were let out of a cage. Cause, right. Know, it, right. Cause it had been a while, you know, everything was locked down. And so it's like, we're free, you know? Well, absolutely. That, you know, that's, I think, one of the problems that, you know, apart from the obvious that the pandemic caused was just this, all this social isolation. And especially if you're a gigging musician, oh boy, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was a very strange time and it would kind of open up for a minute, you know, and then it would lock back down. And so you kind of never knew where you were, you know? Right, right. absolutely. So now the album, obviously it starts with uh, Preach for which there is also a video, but how, in which order did you start? Cause that's with Randy Brecker, who is another absolute monster how yeah. did how did you when you say you start putting it together what what's your process how do you does it just happen organically as it happens or do you have like a set thing that you have to follow well I mean I started kind of writing tunes a, you know a while back and just kind of salting them away with this idea in mind you know and then when I felt like I had enough tunes it's like okay let's call a rehearsal see how this stuff sounds and you know it all sounded good and then, um, you know, I was wanting to invite various people that I was either good friends with or, you know, had become acquainted with in some way. So and, and people that I really admire. So one of them is Randy Brecker, who I had met on a jazz cruise. I was playing with Steve Tyrell oh, and I, you know, got to meet uh, Randy and we, kind, you know, kind of talked a bit. And he's a super nice guy. 
so I, I kind of actually I gave him some of my earlier albums and he e emailed back that he really liked him. And then wow. I said, well, if I ever had a track that, you know, would be kind of up your alley, would you do it? And he goes, absolutely. So, That's great. you know, Preach just sounded like the perfect vehicle for Randy. And uh, he sounds great on it. Yes, he does. We actually we were listening to the album again last night in, in uh, preparation for today while we were putting our Christmas tree up and hanging our baubles so it's we perfect were... holiday music <laughs> it is yes. well it's you know but what i love about this record is it's not just holiday music which which has a seasonal thing no, it I is was, i was kidding is, about that. yeah right no but it, it just it's it's perfect dinner party music yachting mm. boating music you know it's it's just it's so well meticulously executed it's it's just the love you feel coming from it is yeah. is just great, great. Well, oh, thanks so much. It was a you know super fun album to make. I'll tell you that. You know, where did you record? All over the place, um, or a couple different studios. The first session we did it over like basically two and a half days, but spread out over a couple months. So we did one session at a place in North Hollywood or Van Nuys here uh, called Stag Street, an old school studio that's been around for a while. And then we did the next couple batches of sessions at a really beautiful private studio in Agoura called uh, Dragonfly Creek. And the guy, he's, he has, you know, some acreage and he has like a horse ranch in front with horses running around. And then you kind of drive in and there's a, you know, isolated separate studio there. And it's just really, you know, beautiful. very peaceful environment to record in. It's really nice. Yeah, there are some, some great places out there in the West Valley. We go out there quite a bit with some of our acts like Nick Marshall was out there last week with Albert Lee and um, yeah. the immediate family, all those cats um, sure. at the Canyon Club. But when you drive, if you don't take the freeway and you drive over Canaan Doom or Topanga to, to the back roads, it's, there's really some incredible places out there in the, in the hills in yeah. them there are hills as they say. I know. Yeah. And you feel like you're kind of away from stuff where, you know, really it's only a couple miles to Ventura Boulevard and kind of civilization, but, you know, you get up in the hills a bit and it's like, wow, we're in just, you know, in the middle of it. Absolutely. Beautiful. So tell me, um, there's, there's a, a Latin influence track that I love on this, this project. It's uh, Carlos en Siete. Right. Where, what's, the, what's the inspiration, the story on that one? Well, Carlos, of course, is Carlos Santana, who I've always loved and who, in fact, plays kind of bluesy, you know, in a way, even though it's Latin influence, you know, whatever. Um, and Carlos and Siete, if you're not very good at Spanish, which I'm not, means Carlos and seven, and the song is written in seven four time. So oh, cool. it's Carlos in cool. seven four time. Oh, you know, I see. Three. I wondered. How, I knew Siete was seven, but I, I'm not um, enough of a musician to know what what the reference was. Andrew was a um, what piano teacher mm -hmm. or, or a piano? Yeah, I was a piano teacher. Yeah, at uh, the age of just before 14 in England. I was Very called nice. a, lic a licentiate of the Victoria College of Music. Sounds a bit naughty, doesn't it? A Very impressive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, that forced me into getting piano lessons, of course, oh. when you had an ex-qualified piano teacher for a mother, which I hate. I was more interested in ballet and rugby. But, uh, yeah, no, I had I to take yeah. And I assume you quit piano at some point. Did yeah. you quit? When? And did that break your heart, Angie? Did that? You know? No, I, I've learned to go with the flow. <laughs> okay. As you can imagine with my life. Yes. Yeah. So it, it led me into piano lessons. But what, what happened one day, I was sitting in the dining room trying to learn a piece called Golden Slumbers. And mm -hmm. I was absolutely mangling this thing. Murdering it. But, okay, okay, fine. Okay. Whatever. I'll take your version. And uh, my stepbrother, Paul, was staying at home that weekend. And he, th this was just giving him back toothache, you know. And he came down. He said, shove over on the piano seat. What on earth are you murdering today? And I showed him the music. And at that point, he didn't read music either. And so he said, all right, well, let's tackle this together. The, the, the C, I know on a piano, is next to the lock. The lock in the middle. When you open the lid, the one above the lock is, is middle, middle C. C. <laughs> yeah. And that was, that was all he knew at that point. And so um, we started tackling this this piece together, picking out the you know A G D D F A or whatever the scales are. And um, he said, "Oh, this is really nice. Where, where's this from? Who wrote it?" And I said, "Oh, it's 
think 15th, 16th century. It's by an old classic poet actually called Thomas Decker. And he said, fantastic. And I said, well, I was about seven or eight years old. I said, why are you so excited? He said, well, I, I think I'm going to put little bits of this on the next album. I'll, and I can call it Golden Slumbers because it's out of copyright. <laughs> All right. That's yes. a great story. It's so cool. <laughs> so there you go. So a little, a little tiny trivia piece of history. But isn't it amazing how influences and um, just happenstances creep, creep in to music, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, like everything, it's the sum total of your experiences, right? So, you know, this blues album came out, came about because I was kind of, I've always liked to play bluesy stuff, even though I'm kind of more of a jazzy guitar player. But, you know, I'm kind of a little of everything. I'm not, you know, any one thing. So, you know, blues stuff is what I've always loved. And this project, the idea was that it could, every, every song be bluesy in some way but not necessarily be straight up traditional kind of blues, you know, form. Mm. Right. And well, uh, Carlos and Siete, you know, uh, the chords of that go far away from blues chords, but you know, the song still sounds kind of bluesy. So. Sure. I mean, it's, yeah, the, there's only so much traditional, you know, three chord Memphis blues you can listen to before it's like, okay, well, what are they going to stretch the lyric to next time? So that's what I love about this record is that it is kind of, it's new blues, right? It's, it's hybrid from your jazz background. And then you've got people like, you know, Robin Ford and Russell Ferrante, John yeah. Jorgensen. Um, and the, the title that I love the most made me smile was one G and two J's. Tell, tell the folks a little about that, that track. Well, that's actually, that is the last, tune I wrote for specifically for this record, because I wanted to do a tune that could feature me, you know, Joe, Joe Bonamassa and Josh Smith. And that right. title is just our initials, one right. G and two J's. So, uh, but it sounds a little gangster somehow, if you don't know what the title is, you know? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was in the key of G or it was recorded on Blue Jay Way or we, we had a little guessing game about that last night. Yeah, well, that's so. a, see, I love that, that you don't know what it is, but I'm the G and then Joe and Josh are the J's. So the all, also be revealed on T-Flex. Yes, exactly. Right. And it's kind of, a, you know, a Bo Diddley influence. It's got kind of a Bo Diddley beat and the melody is harmonized for three guitars. So all three of us kind of play the melody in harmony. And then we each take a solo and then we each kind of trade off and it's, this becomes this little guitar battle. And it was really fun to do that. I bet. Well, but, you know, the, everybody on this record is an absolute monster. But when you get, you know, the, the Bonamassas in the room, it's just a joy to. to he to is really hear, something. Right? And Josh Smith, you know, his, his kind of buddy, they produce records together. And, you know, right. Josh is no slouch either. You know, both killer just absolutely killer players. Well, I'm sure if the, if they're in Grant Geisman's Rolodex, then they're not as, not slouches. Well, let's, no, let's not you know let's not overstate it here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's amazing. And uh, with her piano background, she was interested about your um, television. Oh yes, the music involvement for things like Two and a Half Men and Mike yeah. and Molly and Monk. So tell us some more about that. How did you get well, involved? Well, Monk is one of the earlier things I did, which I just pl I only played on it. It was written by a composer named Jeff Beal, and it was kind of this Django Reinhardt sort of influenced acoustic guitar thing. And he called me to go in and play it. And it's a really very cool, um, you know, melody. And I think he actually won an Emmy for that theme. And you know, you can get a participation certificate. So he got one for me and. You know, uh, oh. it basically says thanks for your participation in this Emmy winning, you know, That's piece. Nice. Very nice. Very, very, very cool. Yes. But the two nice. and a half man stuff, you know, I got really lucky with that. I, you know, knock on wood. But yeah. I, I co wrote the theme. And, um, you know, Charlie Sheen on the show p plays a jingle writer. Yes. And um, so th there was always kind of fun specialty music you'd have to do, like where, Charlie's sitting at the piano working some s song or some silly little jingle thing. And we'd have to I'm, kind of do that stuff. And, and it was really <laughs> amazing. I, I think, unfortunately, I, I know all of them from Oshikuru, too, because I'm a big kid now. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, as, a, as a former lyricist myself, I was always, I always chuckle because we watch 7.30 at night in L.A. on KTLA, is Charlie time. We just yell Charlie throughout the house and all the TVs go on to Two and a Half Men. 
And um, it just, as a former lyricist, it just amazes me the, the just the depth and complication of the two words in the opening theme. <laughs> Men, 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 manly men. Manly men. Yeah, <laughs> it was a very complicated lyric, you know. Yeah. But, but you know, some, some like Oshikuru, Chuck Lorre. He actually Chuck Lorre wanted to be a songwriter. That was init his initial thing he wanted to do. And he tells a story about uh, he was studying at University of Miami, and this young kid comes in, you know, who looks like he's about sixteen, but you know, it, it turned out to be Pat Metheny giving a kind of a master class. And he said, Pat Metheny played for about 30 seconds and Chuck thought to himself, I need to get a different career. <laughs> get about it. So, but anyway, so some of the little silly songs Chuck Lorre actually wrote, like Oshikuru, he wrote the kind of basic melody of it and then we kind of, you know, arranged it and whatever, but. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, the Charlie Waffles had uh, quite some success in the series. That was they? hilarious. For those things, the writers would usually give us the lyrics, and then they'd say, just set these things to music. It's going to be this silly kids, you know, thing. The Charlie Waffles thing was hilarious. Yeah. And then for that, we had to take Charlie Sheen into a recording studio and pre-record all, all his stuff. Oh. And he was actually great to work with. He was always super nice to us, you know, and... Um, you know, I, I have nothing bad to say about Charlie Sheen. He was always very professional guy when we worked with him, you know. Well, he yeah. comes from a long line of professional people, doesn't he? Absolutely. Oh, his dad yeah. and his brother and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that just the, the casting gods that put all of those people in that show, uh, you know, the core the core five people, um, yeah. just oh, yeah. the two brothers are so damn different. And then this goofy kid. Uh, my favorite character is, is Berta, I Berta. gotta say. Yeah. She gets the killer lines. <laughs> right. And she Rose is hilarious. I mean, all of them are great. And then, you know, Angus T. Jones, you know, who came in as a very young person, you know, yes. he just nails his lines. I mean, and he's a little kid, you know? I know. Yes. Now, that must have been a heck of an experience. It was really fun. You know, it, it's, it's the longest kind of steady job I've ever had because we did it for all 12 seasons, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, we really got to know the people, you know, all the actors and, you know, it was just a magical experience. And like I say, I got very, very lucky, you know, to be involved but in. That. At the same time, obviously, you're doing TV music and, and Two and a Half Men. But at the same time, you're still also doing Sidemen sessions for other other projects and then your own records and your own gigs and your own ah. touring. Where do you where do you get the energy from? Do you just love me? <laughs> I, I often ask myself that. You know, but, but truthfully, once when I was doing the show, I couldn't really tour as much. And I also couldn't do as many sessions, obviously, because, you you know, you actually sign a contract that you will be there whenever they need you to be there, which turned out to be fairly often because, you know, there would be some singing thing they'd have to do. So, you, you know, we'd have to go to all the run throughs and all the whatever and, you know, make changes daily as it went along. So I really couldn't be out of town or sitting up you know in hollywood on a session or something like that so or on, a, on a plane wow well that's but a big com no complaints you know oh no, no. no absolutely so um obviously with the with we're here to talk about blues today but of of the other 15 albums that you've uh, created and produced and, and given to the world are there any like standout moments or funny stories or just you know sessions that stick in your head wow moments I mean, I don't know if there's, well, yes, there are some wow moments. Um, the three albums prior to Blues, I actually formed my own little label called Futurism, and I, I released three albums of kind of a jazz trilogy. Uh, the first one's called Say That, and then the one called Cool Man Cool, and then the third one is called Bop Bang Boom. Um, right. On the Cool album, Cool Man Cool album, I reconnected with Chuck Mangione and I had written a tune specifically for him to play on called Chuck and Chick, which refers to Chuck Mangione and his longtime friend, Chick Corea. Yeah, so okay. the story about that tune is around the time I, we were recording the Feel So Good album way back when with Chuck Mangione, there was some talk that Chuck and Chick might do an album together, which they never did. It never happened. But that's... Okay. That stuck in my mind like, huh, I wonder what that would have sounded like. So yeah. I decided to try to write a tune where the first part of the tune might sound like 
something Chuck Mangione would write, and the second part would might sound like something Chick Corea would write. So it's mm. called Chuck and Chick. And I flew Chuck out, and he was in the studio with us recording. We did three different songs with him on that record. And then later, Chick Corea, I asked him if he would play on it, and he did. So oh. Chuck and Chick are both playing on that tune. So that has to be, you know, definitely one of the wow moments for me. Yeah, that's that's a pretty incredible, you know. Yeah. Just getting the stars to align, A, that they're available, and B, that they loved it so much that they did it. Right, exactly. Um, in fact, you know, they may not have made an album together, but you had the blessing to put them together, and that will exist forever for all yeah. of us. I know. And then you might, you know, it gives you some idea of my, what that might have sounded like if they did a whole project, you know? Yeah. And that really is one of my favorite songs I've ever written, I have to say. And speaking of Chuck Mangione, obviously the uh, the elephant solo guitar solo in the room, <laughs> which I'm sure you get sick and tired of being asked to play. I, um, I don't get sick of it. It's an incredible honor that people still talk about it, you know? How, what was the process of, you know, feel so good? Was the track laid down um, and then you went in and put a solo in or were you just all jamming around and you came up with the parts? Kind of, okay, so both. Um, the Feel So Good band kind of came together in let's see, now, January of 1977. I had done a few gigs with Chuck at the end of 76, and he asked me to join his band. And then he said about kind of putting a, um, getting a new bass player and a new drummer from LA, who turned, and we did auditions, and I recommended Charles Meeks, who, the bass player. And then he recommended James Bradley Jr., the drummer. So we had this kind of young LA rhythm section from LA, you know, uh, nice. with all the LA licks and stuff like that. So now we were a band and we went on the road like in January of 77 and we recorded the Feel So Good album in around like August of 77. So we'd been playing together for a while. And um, what happened was we went in the studio for a couple of days and Chuck just passed out music and we just kind of tried ideas of stuff, of songs that would be on the Feel So Good album, you know? Um, wow. And so the solo that I play on the final record is actually based on what I played on that demo. Like there was stuff that we just all fell in love with on the demos. And so all of us did this. We kind of learned what we did and then transferred it to the final tracks that we did later. You know, so that solo is a combination of my improvisation, which I relearned and then stuff I didn't like. And I fixed up for the final one. So it's kind of both, you know, both improvisation and composition of the solo. So do you, when you're performing that live, do you feel pressure to get every damn note right? Because everyone in the world knows it. <laughs> well, so, you know, in the old days when I was, we were touring, because we relentlessly toured in Chuck, like in the late, with Chuck in the late 70s. And I never felt compelled to play the solo note for note in those days, because it was kind of like a jazz oriented band. We didn't, you know, we're not like the Eagles where we have to play Hotel California note for note every night, you know. So in those days, if I felt like playing it note for note, I would. But often I would just like play something else, you know, it's jazz, whatever. Um, right. But lately, if I if I am compelled to play it, I will do it note for note because I figure, OK, people want to hear it. So I'm going to do it, you know. Right. Although in this in this day and age of iPhones, it, it must be funny to be you're sitting in this power position of I could give it to them on their iPhones note for note. Or I could mess with their heads and play a new one. <laughs> well, I could do that too. But yeah. the thing about note for note is I'm happy I can still do it. So uh -huh. I'm happy to play it, you know? Yeah. I mean, how, how many fingers do you have to put on that thing? It sounds That's like two. three extra ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, hold up your hands. How many fingers have you got on each hand? Because well, wow, I, you know, I add to it when I get the guitar out. <laughs> <laughs> and wanted to ask you about your. Uh, your comic book. Oh, yes. Obsession and your books. Oh. Well, Mad Men in particular. Uh, Mad, Mad, Mad Magazine. Magazine. Mad, Mad Magazine. Magazine. Mad Men. Well, so this is, you know, <laughs> this is like a side thing. And a lot of people don't even know that I, I've written five books related to Mad Magazine and yes. what they call the EC comics uh, yeah. from the 1950s, like Tales from the Crypt and Weird Science and Vault of Horror and all this stuff. I'm yeah. basically a historian with regard to that stuff. I, I don't draw comics. I can barely draw a stick figure, you know. But um, 
but I've written basically histories of, related to these books. And, and the most recent one is this giant coffee table book published by Tashin called The History of EC Comics. Wow. And um, it's 15 and a half inches high and it oh. weighs about 13 pounds oh. and it has nearly 600 pages. So, Wow, I've had dogs smaller than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's a huge book. Good God. Yeah. Um, last week's guest on T Flix was Ross Hogarth, the producer, engineer, mixer, genius person. And his father um, drew Tarzan for oh, Edgar right. He was Bern the first. Burn Hogarth. Yeah. yeah. Ben Hogarth is Ross, was Ross's father. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know his work. Yep. Yep. Small world. And then uh, another friends of ours that we're doing a lot of metaverse NFT stuff with in Toronto, David is a crazy, I'll let him know about your book. He's a crazy comic book collector and figures and he goes to comic cons and all kinds of stuff all over the world. It's it's such a huge, huge market. Oh, it's getting more huge. It is. I mean, I remember when San Diego Comic Con was really only comic book fans, you know, way back when. And now it's this mega thing with movies and TV and just, every, you know, every kind of tie in toys you can imagine. So yeah. it's huge at this point. Yeah, it's it's the Comic-Con phenomenon is it, I mean, it's in even in Liverpool in our hometown. They've, they've translated. Well, it. it's now been introduced to a, a new generation, you see. So and well, it's, all, you know, it's, all about, it's pop kids. culture in general. So it's, it's very yeah. wide. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think as a lot of these kids, we were watching uh, CNN, Lisa Ling on Sunday night. A lot of these kids, especially since the pandemic, they've got social anxiety. They're very withdrawn. They're gamers. They live in game universe. And they've got those dating pools in the metaverse and whatever. It's easy for people who are socially anxious to communicate through character or through dress up or through cosplay or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, whatever helps them communicate and be happy, it's, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good way to think of it, for sure. Absolutely. So back to uh, to wrap up with it with this wonderful record. If you guys, we, we have it on Apple Music. Uh, you can also buy it on iTunes, which I would recommend, because then you can walk around with it in your uh, in your ear rolls. It looks a lot like this. It looks a lot like yes. that. but And it looks <laughs> like that backwards. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And if, 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 of course, there are any Grammy v- voters um, watching, of course, Grant, Grant isn't going to participate in this ask, but please really do give this an extra listen and give it your vote because it's, it's such a worthwhile, beautiful project. It just touched our hearts. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure all of our listeners or viewers will want to know how to find you. So tell us all the best ways to communicate with you. Well, I'm on, you know, I'm on Facebook. You can, I think there's only one of me, only one Grant Geisman. So, yeah. um, and then I have a website, grantgeisman.com. Yep. And, you know, there's uh, different videos on YouTube. There's a bunch of stuff where I go talk to Norm at Norman's Rare Guitars. And he always kind of makes you, you know, do a video. He'll show you some great guitar and, and he goes, oh, you sound great on it. Do a video. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But those are fun, and Norm's a great guy, and oh, so there's all yeah. kinds of stuff that you could find. But you know, please do give Blues a listen, spelled B L O O Z. Right. It's not because I didn't know how to spell Blues. It's because <laughs> everything's uh, you know, bluesy. Well, so wearing blue today. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you for that. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been a joy, Grant. I know you're a, a busy man, running in and out of studios and pre-award brunches and things like that. So thank you so much for spending the time with us. Yeah, we've enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Oh, thank a- you. This was really fun. You guys are a hoot. It was really fun to visit with you. Oh, Absolutely. good. Thank Let's you, my darling. Do it again. And hopefully yes. we'll uh, we'll run into you very, very soon. Okay. I hope so. All right. All right thanks. You take care, my darling. Bye-bye. Well, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.